Good morning, everybody. I'm happy that you're all back this early, because it was late yesterday evening, uh, back for the official opening of uh, the Celebrating Descent Festival. My name is Juri Albrecht. I'm the director of the Bali. And um, it's a wonderful festival. It's wonderful that you're here. Yesterday, we had a sort of an, a pre-festival, an opening with conversations with a few of the guests who will be speaking today and tomorrow. Um, we have a packed program on celebrating dissent, a festival on the freedom of thought, um, but more especially on the freedom of women to express themselves. And um, although some men will participate in the conversations, it's very special to have more than 40 people from all over the world who uh, dedicate their lives to the possibilities and the rights of women to dissent and to live the lives in the way they want to live it and to think uh, and speak about the things they think are important for them in their lives. So very warm welcome to all the participants and speakers. Um, it's wonderful that you made it from all over the globe. Um, there were some hiccups with a visa and, uh, for, and with, uh, with other things, with flights. Um, but by now, I've, almost everybody is here. Um, Zinab El Razoui is not here who uh, wanted to be here. Uh, we did our utmost best uh, and we are really, really very impressed by the Dutch uh, Amsterdam mayor of Amsterdam, the mayor of Amsterdam, Femke Halsma, who is not only opening this festival, which is a wonderful thing, because um, for a lot of us here uh, today um, uh, gathered, it's not so normal that the authorities are actually welcoming people who have the courage to think out loud and to think out in the way they want. So it's exceptionally beautiful that we have the mayor of Amsterdam here to open this. I think it's a very symbolic thing. And even more so, because it's not just a symbolic thing, it's a very, very practical thing, because yesterday the mayor did her utmost best to, um, uh, to make sure that it would have been possible for Zina Belrazou to come. And I like to stress that because I think it's really, really interesting that it's not only with words that you make the space for um, to think out loud and to think about the things you want. It's with deeds. And indeed, it matters if, poli <coughs> if uh, politicians uh, do their best and actually do something. And so thank you very, very much, Mayor, for trying to make that happen. And it's really wonderful. I've, I've been watching that. It's amazing how, uh, in a job like that, you are able to um, uh, uh, reach down into the practicalities and the organization and try to do your best. It's wonderful. Thank you very much for that. And thank you for being here. Um, um, I think if we look at the practicalities we've, this, we've encountered in the last weeks and months and days um, about organizing a festival on freedom of thought, uh, and by the fact, for instance, that some, that, that some of the main speakers aren't here, and by the fact that we encountered all these problems, you see how important it is that we do an extra effort to make sure that all sort of voices are being heard. So um, I leave it with it. I'm very proud to introduce the mayor who has other things to do because she is the whole day responsible for every, <laughs> everything in the city. So she will be uh, here for a short while, which is extraordinarily beautiful that you're here. Thank you very much, Sam Carlton. Good morning. Thank you, Yuri, and thank you for your warm welcome and for organizing this event and not for the first year because I think it's very important for Amsterdam as it is internationally important. Her heretics, infidels, renegades, welcome to Amsterdam. <laughs> I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to start with a quote. After daily receiving more and more serious information about the ab abominable heresies which he, which he practiced and taught, and after all that he has been investigated, they have decided with their consent that he should be excommunicated and expelled. Cursed be he by day and cursed be he by night, cursed be he when he lies down and cursed be he when he rises up. The Lord will not spare him. But then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy shall smoke against that man and all the curses that are written in this book shall lie upon him and the Lord shall blot out his name from under heaven. Good morning. Again, I hope this old piece of theocratic prose will get you in the mood to celebrate dissent. 
The particular lines I just read are from the official text used to expel Baruch de Spinoza from the Jewish community in Amsterdam in 1656. But the fanatical scribes of the 17th century display some universal aspects of oppressors, much hate, and a complete absence of a sense of humor. I would like to thank Yuri and the Bali for inviting me to open the Celebrating Descent Festival. It's an honor to welcome to Amsterdam the brave men and many heroic women who will take to the stage here today and the coming days. Without dissent and protest, change and, and progress are not possible. Our city has a long history as a safe haven for free thinkers, from Spinoza, who laid the foundation for the Enlightenment, to the first marriage between same-sex couples. Amsterdam has often, has often served as the backdrop for those people pursuing freedom and resist prevailing prejudice and dogmas. We should learn from this aspect of our history. It's an incentive to guard our freedom every day and to resist complacency. Because even this city knows the consequences from distant and recent history if we do not guard our freedom. If we do not have the courage to protest or at least to listen to those who do have the courage. Spinoza was a little bit of a misogynist and he would probably be surprised that today so many of the most outspoken and courageous champions of the freedom of thought and expression are women. Yes. It is not a form of victimization if we conclude that female dissent is met with extra malicious and vile opposition. In her manifesto, Women and Power, British classicist Mary Beard describes how, how throughout history the right to public speaking was an exclusive right to men. She observes that although a huge amount has been achieved, it still seems to be the case today. And I quote her, it doesn't much matter what line you take as a woman if you venture into tradi traditional male territory. The, the abuse comes anyway. It's not what you say that prompts it, it's simply the fact that you're saying it. Some of the women who are speaking at the festival are faced with strong and determined opponents who wield the power of states and armed forces. Protecting freedom is, ongoing, is an ongoing struggle in Western democracies too. One which requires vigilance and sometimes loud dissent. Today, we are the city where a drag queen can take a taxi in the middle of the night. But we are also the city where a lesbian couple is beaten up in public. Where, gir where girls who do not want to wear the hijab are beaten or, wor or worse. But also where girls who do want to wear the headscarf are also scolded and harassed. Many of the heroes at this festival are fighting a battle. But not with bullets, missiles or bombs. Their pens voices, and sometimes their naked bodies are their weapons. Only if they have our unconditional support will these weapons be more powerful than the dogmas, propaganda, and thought police of our opponents. Take a look. <laughs> Take a look at the, at the women appearing on stage after me. They are not only the hope for freedom in the countries that they come from. 
they are also an example for Amsterdam, a source of inspiration for women who do not feel that they are seen, a role model for the girls who dare not speak, and a warning for men who still find excuses in their traditions, upbringing, or holy books to deny women the freedom, respect, and dignity that they demand for themselves. If we follow the course of reason and pursue freedom, we shape our own identities. Spiritual practices can be a source of inspiration, but cannot trump our individual conscience. Traditions can bring generations together, but they must not stand in the way of modernization. The love of one's country is better expressed through, through ideas on how to improve it than through glorification of an imaginary community. Identity politics can be a part of emancipatory struggles, but this should not lead to parochialism and the cult of victimization. Sometimes it seems that the brave dissenters are small in numbers, but they are the voices of many. As we have seen recently on the streets of Moscow and Hong Kong. So let's give them the stage, let's lend them our ears, let's show our support to the heretics, the infidels, and the rene renegades. Thank you and enjoy. I'm so sorry I don't have the day off because I would really enjoy being uh, amongst you and talk with you, maybe next year. Have a good day. That was a, a very, very nice opening. Uh, uh, wonderful that Mayor made it, and um, that she made a connection to the Dutch and Amsterdam history, uh, to uh, the to the people who are, will be speaking here today and tomorrow. Um, I'll um, uh, I'm just shortly back to uh, announce the chair of this first morning session, Samira Bouhipti. I'm very glad you're here. Um, we know each other for a long while. Um, Shamira has been a member of the local council for the Liberal Party, and she's one of the few people uh, in Dutch politics who uh, crossed the aisle, to say it like that, who um, changed from uh, socialists to liberals, which already shows her um, uh, independence and her uh, independent way of thinking. Um, she's a very good chair. We've uh, worked together on many occasions on um, uh, freedom of thought, on uh, women rights, and it's very wonderful that you're uh, agreeing to chair the first meeting, Shamira. So a warm welcome to Shamira Bushipti. Um, like this, because the fire is okay, but close. Problem. Very good uh, morning. 
Welcome everyone to the festival celebrating descent and in particular to this program, a conversation on women descent. We have a very interesting program ahead, but first there are some announcements I want to make. In the Bali, all programs are live streams and can be watched until the eternity on the website of the Bali. There will be room, of course, for you to ask questions at the end of the program. If you have a question, make sure your sentence ends with a question mark. Please, please. We have till one o'clock and we have a lot to do. Before we are going to begin to talk, um, we are going to listen to Shelley Chagall. She's a singer and songwriter involved in secular activism. Her first record, an 80s album, is a passionate response to dogmatic belief in equality and religious oppression. She has released seven recording projects and runs an independent record label, True Music, where she works with other artists. With that being said, please welcome Shelley Chagall. Good morning. It's an honor to be here with you today to celebrate the voices of freedom and the spirit of dissent. I hope that this weekend we'll honor those who fight and will reinvigorate and motivate all of us to continue the work and the movement that you will hear about over the festival. This song was inspired by the words of uh, many of the brave speakers that you will hear over the weekend. It is a reflection of our message. It is our resistance. Now is the hour for the woman's voice.
It is not working now anymore. But I'm not going to sing. Um, I'm going. Yes, thank you so much. Um, she is an Iranian born writer and activist. She is the spokesperson for Fitna, movement for women's liberation, one law for all, and a council of ex Muslims in Britain. She also hosts a weekly television program in Persian and English called Bread and Roses, and perhaps. Perhaps even more important, she has initi initiated this festival together with the Bali. She will tell us something about the importance of this weekend. I want you to welcome you. Very honored to meet you. Mariam Nama Aziz. I just, sorry, want to be sure my PowerPoint is working. Ah, how do I do this? I'm, I'm stupid when it comes. Oh, here, there, it, I did it. <laughs> sorry, I, I don't know. I have to go back to the first one. Hello? I'll pray to him, he'll get it working. Oh, oh you have to do this. Point, point a bit that way because the receiver is over there. Thank you. Hello, my darlings. It's such an emotional uh, weekend. It's such a great pleasure to be here. Welcome to uh, the wonderful dissenters. That mayor was bloody great, wasn't she? I usually don't even listen to political people, but she was bloody amazing, honestly. She was amazing. Um, I, I want to welcome all of you. My little Baba, my son, is here. <laughs> Um, and I want to welcome all of you wonderful dissenters. Uh, I think it's such a great thing to be amongst friends after all the battles we face outside, all the beatings we get. It's nice to be in a nice, safe space. Uh, I'm just kidding. Um, and of course, I also am so grateful to, uh, to Debali, Yuri Albrecht, uh, Sophie Ruth in France, and uh, Iante Mosalman uh, for giving us this space. You know, they may not realize it, but we are so shunned and ostracized and victim blamed and vilified that this warm welcome is a bit overwhelming and it just means so much to us. So thank you. I, we're so used to being told, uh, you know, uh, it's your fault uh, this is happening to you, that you've been threatened uh, or you've been shunned. You know, you d walked the streets unveiled. You blasphemed. You said you were an ex-Muslim on Facebook. You provoked. You offended the fragile sensibilities of parasitical imams and clerics and, uh, you know, misogynist and homophobic theocrats. Uh, so if you hadn't done that, there would be no need to kill you. I mean, honestly, I've heard this many times. As if the Islamists or the religious right need an excuse to kill you. They attack schools and weddings and marketplaces and churches and mosques. They don't need an excuse to kill. And it's as if offense or blasphemy is actually more important than murder. And we see very often that this victim blaming goes hand in hand with perpetrators pretending or acting as victims. There's a great Jesus and Mo cartoon where um, Muhammad says, I don't understand uh, why uh, blasphemous cartoons aren't illegal because they incite violence. And Jesus says, well, most of them are just disrespectful pictures of you and me, Jesus and Muhammad. They don't really incite anything, do they? And Muhammad says, of course they do. All blasphemy is incitement to violence. How? Because the punishment for blasphemy is death, and we can't kill blasphemers 
non-violently. We can't do it non-violently. You know, and I think this is exactly the perpetrators acting as uh, victims. Um, and there's always, I think we all feel it, this underlying message that we are always to blame. It sometimes is very direct, like the BBC journalist yesterday saying, you know, nobody's interested in, in, in people who've left Islam. Nobody cares. Uh, you know, excuse us for living. And, and sometimes it's more subtle. Um, and it's sort of, this victim blaming reminds me of women who are blamed for the length of their skirt when they've been raped. Or uh, Rosa Parks, you know, people telling her, well, you're violating the law. This is what uh, Zarif, Iran's foreign minister, has said about the women who defy compulsory veiling laws. Well, you know, we're giving them 24 years because they're violating our laws. Uh, you know, it's the same sort of things that were told to people like Rosa Parks. Uh, the suffragist movement, you know, how many times were they told that their movement is anti-men? And we often hear this accusation against us too. We're fighting for our right to live, and we're often accused of being anti-Muslim. And the reality is that blasphemy and apostasy are not bigotry, full stop. And of course, everyone loves a victim. They love us if we're quiet. They hate us when we speak out. The message is always stay in your place, know your limits, or else. There's always an, an or else. If you leave the house unveiled, don't blame us if you provoke a man and get raped. There's this constant underlying message. Uh, Naughty Naghabi does a great cartoon where, uh, you know, the, the two Naghabis, and I, I think the Naghabis and the Borga is a symbol of the political Islamic movement, where they're talking about different things that have happened. Uh, you know, oh, um, there's a flogging in Saudi Arabia. Well, you know, you, you do the crime, you pay the price. Uh, sorry, I can't read my uh, that far. Um, but, you know, there's a cartoonist in Iran arrested well, they shouldn't have insulted the prophet, or uh, people are killed, uh, satirists in Charlie Hebdo are killed, well, you know, this is what do you expect if you're going to do stuff like that. And then there's ex-Muslims on, fa on uh, social media saying why they've left Islam, and immediately is, this is outrageous, you know, with this bullying and harassment of Muslims needs to stop. When is this ever going to end? And you see this a lot, isn't it? It's as if speaking out, blasphemy and apostasy is equated uh, with hate, whereas in fact it's combating the hate that we often are faced uh, uh, via religion. And of course, this is not to say um, that bigotry doesn't exist. You know, this is one of the accusations we often get when we speak out. Islamophobe, neocon, neocolonialist, Uncle Tom, House Arab, and all of these, these things. But, uh, uh, you know, and the point of the matter is that blasphemy isn't uh, bigotry. Uh, but of course, bigotry exists. And we do understand that more than most because a lot of us are migrants, asylum seekers. We are part of those teeming millions who are trying to reach safety, very often trying to cross European borders, who want to live lives uh, free from the constraints, both of US-led militarism, but also of the religious right. So we understand racism more than most. Our families, many of them, our loved ones are still Muslims. But you cannot stop racism by imposing blasphemy laws. And blasphemy is not the same thing as bigotry. Yes. I'm glad you concur. I'm glad you concur. Um, and, and honestly, when you think about it, really, what is more bigoted than religion? You know, it, it's so bigoted. And if you're really concerned about bigotry, well, check your cultural relativism and your multiculturalism as a social policy, where you see communities as homogenous and refuse to accept dissent and doubt within those who are considered minorities. You can't excuse theocrats because of bigotry, but you also cannot excuse bigotry because of theocrats. I think one of the things we say often is that we have to fight on many fronts. We have to fight racism, we have to fight the far right, and by far right, it includes the Islamists. They are our far right, they are our fascists, but also the white nationalists, who actually have more in common with the Islamists than they let on. And all the while, though, we must honor 
and celebrate dissent, but also honor and celebrate our dissenters, many of whom are sitting here today and many of whom we've lost, we've lost. They are no longer with us. There are so many empty chairs at empty tables because they have lost their lives in this fight. And I think the celebration of dissent, when you can be killed for it, is hugely important. You have to do it. You have to celebrate it. You have to shout your dissent from every rooftop until it's no longer necessary. Uh, and and in, in every way possible, sometimes people think you go too far, but there is no going too far when you can be killed for it. Whether it's defending the right to be atheist, whether it's defending the right to be ex-Muslim because of bacon, or because there are no 72 virgins for me, whether it's nude protest, thanks to Femen for making us all comfortable with our bodies, whether it's smoking and eating during Ramadan and fastifying, whether it's kissing and uh, violating public morality, religious public morality, which is very often immorality, like Betsy from Morocco has done with her group Mali, um, whether it's saying Allah is gay or make love, not Sharia, um, whether it's defending women who've been sentenced to 55 years altogether in prison for merely compuls uh, defying compulsory hijab rules, whether it's defending the women and men of Rojava in Syrian Kurdistan that have created the center of enlightenment, the center of secularism, and the center of feminism in the world today. Uh, supporting them, I think, is key if we are going to support dissenters. You know the saying that says, well-behaved women rarely make history? Well, we know they never make history. But we infidels, we dissenters, us ex-Muslims, us apostates, us blasphemers, our, us heret heretics, many of us sitting here today, we intend to make history. Thank you for coming. Welcome. Love you guys. I uh, love you, <laughs> really. I love you all, but you are the first, because uh, Taslima Nasrin, uh, the, uh, she's uh, the next woman, and she's fighting for oppression and celebrating dissent, is an award-winning writer, a physician, and an activist, known for her powerful writings on woman oppression. Uh, criticism and criticism of religion, despite forced exile, multiple fatwas, calling for her death. Taslima Nasrin, warm welcome, and thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Secularism is necessary for women's freedom simply because religions, all religions, are opposed to women's freedom. No woman can have the rights and freedom she deserves under any religious laws. Women have greater rights in those countries where laws are not based on religion and where the state is separated from religion. Women are more sorely oppressed in those countries where the state and religion are not strictly separated, where laws are based on religion, where societies are not secular, and where the people follow religious tenets and are not educated about women's equality. State, the state must be separated from religion so that laws can be religion free. Uh, Islam must not be exempted from critical scrutiny, neither must any other religion. Islam in particular needs to undergo a process of enlightenment and reformation similar to what other religions have experienced. Mm. Women's rights are human rights. 
But Islam doesn't consider women to be a separate human being. It teaches that the male was the original creation, womankind was created secondarily and solely for man's pleasure. Islam treats women as intellectual, moral, and physical inferiors. In marriage, Islam protects the rights of men only. The Quran gives men total freedom within marriage, saying, your women are as your field, go unto them as you will. The Hadith says that two prayers never reach the heavens. First, those of, real, those of escaping slaves, and second, those of reluctant women who frustrate their husbands at night. Islam considers women psychologically inferior too. They are, not allowed in, they are not allowed to testify in divorce cases. If a woman is raped, she must produce four male witnesses for the court. If she cannot, no charge will be brought. In Islamic law, the testimony of two women is worth that of one man. If a man suspects his wife of adultery or denies the legitimacy of the offspring, his testimony is worth that of four witnesses. A wife has no right to charge her husband in a similar manner, nor can women inherit property on equal terms with their brothers. Allah proclaims that when an estate is settled, a male shall inherit twice as much as a female. In Bangladesh, in the beginning of, 90, of the 1990s, hundreds of thousands of Islamists burned my books publicly and marched to demand my execution by hanging. Fatwas, Islamic religious edicts were issued against me. A price was set on my head. Instead of resisting the Islamists, the government took action against me. I was accused of blasphemy and finally thrown out of my country. My crime was uh, writing these words. It is dangerous to follow the religious scriptures uh, in this modern world. Not only the Quran, but all the religious scriptures are out of time and out of place. And they are all anti-women. Uh, I completed 25 years of exile this month. I cannot go back to my country. Without criticism of Islam, it will never be possible for Islamic countries to separate state and religion, never possible to secularize society, never possible to abolish laws based on Islam and establish laws based on equality. Uh, if that, if uh, this, the country, the state is not secularized, uh, Islamic states will remain in darkness forever and uh, women will never enjoy the right to live as human beings. You know, in the, in the Indian subcontinent, women have been victim of uh, dowry murder, bride burning, gang rape, sexual slavery, and domestic violence. I'm trying my best to fight all kinds of discrimination against women by raising awareness. Um, across the world, the, Islam, the religious fundamentalist, fundamentalism is rising, whether they be Muslim, Hindu, Christian, Jewish, or Buddhist. All religious fu fundamentalists oppose women's rights and freedom of expression. In supporting women's rights everywhere, I have criticized all religions, traditions, cultures, and customs that are anti-women. But to my surprise, I find myself labeled anti-Islam. Some people say I am a Muslim hater, but they are wrong. I stand beside all oppressed people. I stood beside Muslims when they were oppressed in Gujarat, in India, in Palestine. I defended their rights to live, just as I stood beside the Hindus who were oppressed in Bangladesh and the Christians in Pakistan. To me, their religious identity is not important. I consider them as human beings. No one should be oppressed because of their beliefs. 
I believe that no country can become civilized without criticizing the dogmatic practices of its religions. Without separating state and religion, no state or society can become modern. Democracy means nothing if it fails to provide equal rights to women. Ensuring women's rights benefits not only women, but also the men and children in their families and their societies as a whole. It also strengthens democracy and prosperity, enhances stability and encourages tolerance, protecting both the human and property rights of women and of all people is at the core of building a civil law-abiding society. It is the foundation to uh, for true democracy, empowering women through equal access to education and economic opportunity is essential for the eradication of poverty. It alone enables women to effectively participate in the decision-making processes that shape their communities and their lives. Education is increasingly essential if individuals are to succeed in a global and technologically advanced economy. Women's integration into the mainstream of economic life leads not only to signify economic progress for the family, but ultimately for the country as well. Well, um, after I started writing, critics charged that I was influenced by Western feminism, but I had formed my own ideas regarding women's oppression long before I even heard of feminism, Western or otherwise. As I mentioned, I questioned the authoritative, authoritative pronounce, pronouncements of my family and society at large, even as a child. When I was not allowed to play outside, when I was called impure during my menstrual periods, or when I was told by some of my relatives and neighbors that I must cover myself completely in a burqa if I wanted to step out, I dared to question. When strange boys would hurl abuses at me, snatch my scarf or pinch my breasts as I walked, I protested. I could not stomach it when I saw husbands beating their wives or young mothers weeping in anxi anxiety and fear because they had given birth to female babies. Upon observing the shame on the faces of the victim of rape, I felt their pain acutely. I broke down when I heard about women and children being trafficked from city to city, from one country to another, in order to be forced into prostitution. Nothing could make me accept uh, the torture of women by men, by society, or by the state. But no one witnessed my pain, my tears, until I started writing. I did not learn defiance from a book. It is not necessary to read thick, heavy books to be aware. One only needs sharp eyes. In order to demand rights for women, one doesn't need to internalize Simone de Beauvoir or Gloria Steinem. One's own awareness and courage can be enough. If I am hungry, I shall eat. If I am lashed, I shall rest away the lash. If I am oppressed, I shall stand up. These sentiments are universal. Fem feminism is not a property of the West. It is the result of arduous struggle by abused, oppressed, tortured, disrespected, and ignored women coming together, even putting their lives at stake for the sake of their rights. I have learned that women of the West have had no less than their sh share of suffering. Abused and bloodied, they have had their backs to the wall. For centuries, they have been victims of patriarchy, religion, misogynistic traditions, and the like, just like their Eastern counterparts. Religious fanatics have burned them alive. Misogynistic traditions have imposed metallic cages on their bodies in the name of chastity. They have been turned into sex slaves, east or west, north or south, women still suffer for the crime of being women. Human rights are universal. Those who speak of separate lesser human rights for the people of the East and seek to dif distance themselves from the concept of universal human rights, thinking that this stance represent, represents a victory over prolonged oppression by the West, actually end up harming the East more than the West. 
I want to read a poem of mine. The title of this poem is You Go Girl. They said, take it easy, said, calm down, said, stop talking, said, shut up. They said, sit down, said, bow your head, said, keep on crying, let them tears roll. What should you do in response? You should stand up now, should stand right up, hold your back straight, hold your head high. You should speak, speak your mind, speak it loudly, scream. You should scream so loud that they must run for cover. They will say, you are shameless. When you hear that, just laugh. They will say, you have a loose character. When you hear that, just laugh louder. They will say, you are rotten. So just laugh, laugh even louder. Hearing you laugh, they will shout, you are a whore. When they say that, just put your hands on your hips. Stand firm and say, yes, yes, I'm a whore. They will be shocked. They will stare in disbelief. They will wait for you to say more, much more. The men amongst them will turn red and sweat. The women amongst them will dream to be a whore like you. Thank you. Amazing. Taslima, amazing. Really amazing. I know you are going to be, and you are a role model for uh, so uh, many. You go, girl. Later on. Yeah, she, yeah. Possible. Fem feminism is not property of the West, and human rights are universal. Definitely. Thank you so much. We are going to speak uh, later on because I have someone else, a power woman. Uh, uh, I want to introduce you. Um, I would love to introduce you to uh, Ina Shevchenko, and she's the leader of Femin. Yeah, okay. She's She's a uh, topless uh, activist against various manifestations uh, of uh, patriarchy, including dictatorship, religion, and the sex industry. She was kidnapped and threatened by the Belarus KGB in 2011 and was given political asylum in France. She's going to tell us about how religion uh, work uh, together to keep women suppressed and silent, and the first time she noticed did. May I have an applause for Ina Shevchenko. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this presentation. But um, I will allow myself to um, suggest that it's a little bit incomplete. And I will allow myself to give you few more important information from my biography. So my name is Ina Shevchenko, I'm a feminist activist. I'm one of those hysterical immoral women. <laughs> I'm a witch, I'm a satan, I'm a daughter of a devil. According to some, I deserve to burn in hell. According to others, I need to be punished in the name of their gods. Or, and of course, the real women don't need my feminism. <laughs> and so before I go any further, I would like to thank the organizers, this venue, and of course our queen, my goddess, my friend, Mariam Namazi, for inviting me here. I want to thank them for inviting me here because you know it feels so good to be in the same room with fellow hysterically moral women, <laughs> with fellow witches, fellow daughters of devil, and with those not real women who choose feminism over religion. <laughs> Thank you very much, and Taslima, I really all my life dreamed to be a whore just like all of you. 
<laughs> Thank you. So I will speak about this um, conflict, indeed a true conflict between religions and women's rights. And this conflict is ancestral. This conflict is a century long confrontation between the image of an obedient, passive, silent woman and a woman that can be her own authority. It is a confrontation between religious idea of woman's mission as a mother and a wife of someone and a feminist call for women to, lead, to be leaders in this world. All of the Abrahamic religions, all of them, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, subjugate women, infantilize women. They question their worthiness, they deprive them from leadership and attention. They also deprive them from religious leadership. They keep them responsible for the original sin. The woman's body is considered unclean and woman's soul guilty. Religions portray silent women as a role model. A woman worth half a man, she deserves half heritage. Woman has to cover herself up to hide herself in public. She, has, she is a passive, submissive human being. But you know, I look at every woman in this room, I travel the world, I meet different women, believers and unbelievers, I look at myself in the mirror every day, and that's not how we are. That's simply not who we are. We are powerful, independent, we are creative, we are intelligent, and we can be our own authorities. And we can do just everything men can do. And sometimes we do it even better, let's be honest. <laughs> as a feminist, as a woman, therefore, yes, I am in conflict with religions. As a feminist, as a woman, I will be in conflict with religions as long as those religions continue to favor men and as long as they continue to degrade women. I'm in conflict with religions because the role models they propose to me as a woman are either a sinful, full of guilt, Eve, or a passive without sexuality, Virgin Mary. And you know, I simply, I don't like religions because I can't like something that doesn't like me and those like me, those similar to me. Yes, I am in conflict with religions because all gods, all their gods are male. They are the religions, those, are, uh, those religions are the ideologies of fathers and sons. And as Marie Dali phrased it perfectly, if God is male, then man is God. And that's the society we still live in today. Finally, as a feminist, as a woman, I am in conflict with male religions because of their obsession with women's bodies. Yes, this very body that me and my fellow activist fighters put in the center of our own liberation. Religious penetrate each part of women's body with their morals, impose their rules and limitations on us. And to prove you this, I propose you to do a very quick scan of a woman's body. They control where our feet steps in by segregating us in schools and even in places of worship by creating no-go zones for women. Religious institutions for centuries wage war on women's vaginas with their cult of virginity, with sometimes even adopting a barbaric practicing like female genital mutilation and justifying it with uh, some religious ideas of purity for women. And this barbaric crime affects today 200 million women that are alive today, women and girls. They want to control our abdomens. They are, oppressed every, uh, they are obsessed everywhere with forbidding us, with forbidding the right to abort. They want to take away our, our right to decide for our own destinies and our own bodies. And today, as, as we're speaking, only 58 countries in the world provide abortion by request to women. Religious institutions with their modesty dress code emphasize on covering up women's body, especially women's chest, with a loose dress, as they consider it hypersexual part of the body. 
that should be shamefully hidden. And this part of body should be only remembered for the needs of breastfeeding new generations of their sons. But on a personal note, ladies in this room, I think that the need to breastfeed our own revolution is much greater than to breastfeed their generations, right? <laughs> Now I will bring your attention also to our heart. They even forbid us to love who we want to love, with arranged marriage, with child marriage. And of course, we know that all religions are the most often enemies of LGBT rights. These hands, women's hands, are also deprived um, access, from accessing the instruments of power and wealth. And finally, yes, of course, our heads. Our heads, those temples of our personalities, our dreams, our ideas, and the temples where our revolts, revolts rise up. They are all obsessed. They, um, they have this fetishism with women's hair. They force women by laws to cover up their hair. And they do it in a very, um, very, violent manner that even today, so many Iranian women are risking their freedom, decades of their freedom and their lives for just such a simple act as removing a headscarf. And so I hope that everybody in this room will um, salute together with me each of these Iranian women that is either right now is already imprisoned and in facing several decades in jail or that Iranian woman who just posted her video without hijab and is full of fear about what's going to happen to her next. They also target our education as they know that it is education that makes us all unfit to be slaves. And finally, of course, our freedom of thought and freedom of expression. This freedom of thought and freedom of expression is the defining element of our human nature and it is the core of human rights. But what they want, religions, they all want women to be silent. But you know, as this room, this event proves, and every person who's going to speak during these two days, we are not silent. We are no longer silent. And I know that we're so many and there will be millions of us, I promise you. You know, now that I named many reasons why I personally, as a woman, as a feminist, challenge religions, I also want to use the opportunity and to challenge you. I want to challenge in particular my fellow feminists. Indeed, I want to challenge all of us as a society. Yes, fairly recently we made a significant progress in women's rights. And this progress is tremendous. It should be celebrated, it should be pointed out. It is amazing. Yet, we are still very far from that sacred holy dream of gender equality. Pure, full gender equality in our society. We still, still did not reach it. And I believe that it is our fault. I'm sorry to say it is our fault and I think that we all could do better. Let me ask you, and now I'm talking in particular to my fellow feminists, why we're so many and so loud to demand gender quotas to ensure women's leadership in parliaments or entrepreneurship, but we are so few to criticize exclusively male religious leadership. What about gender quota in churches, mosques, and synagogues? How about this? We are denouncing male authority imposed over us in different domains, in many domains, but not in religion. Why we denounce violence of male perpetrators today everywhere, in the streets, but also in Hollywood, yet we still struggle to oppose the unquestionable authority of that male God? What about hashtag me too against God? <laughs> Indeed, if we are to believe the paintings of Da Vinci and the cartoons of Charlie Hebdo, God is the only white bearded man in his 50s whose power isn't criticized by feminists. I'm asking why? <laughs> and finally, why we feminists here in the West 
shout loud with the, with the pride, my body, my rules. And yet, we keep silence about those million um, women in religious states who have to submit their bodies to male rules and cover themselves up. I'm asking why. Now, I personally lost my religion thanks to feminism. As I became aware of discrimination, gender um, inequality and discrimination of women in this patriarchal world, I naturally lost my religion. As religion has always been there to support, to maintain patriarchal culture. I read Bible and I did not only question its, um, you know, the reason behind the, these texts, but I also questioned its moral aspects indeed. I could not I could, I could not accept an ideology, an idea, a dogma that mistreats women, that co considers women as inferior to men. And I'm asking all women of the world, why do you keep supporting or at least keep silence about those ideas? Yes, I'm convinced that religions built around the cult of Father God remains one of the most persistent cause of unequal status of women anywhere in the world. Reproductive rights of women, education rights, heritage and economic empowerment, the question of freedom of sexuality, ownership of a woman's body and leadership of women in this world cannot progress further because of the persistent dominance of religious ideologies. As a matter of fact, I believe that religion is the last cultural barrier towards gender equality, and we need to go beyond it. This is about... <laughs> it is a fight. It is a fight with full of joy, because it's fight for a beautiful model of society in which we've never lived before. This fight is about, women, about whether women will continue to be told by male leaders who to be, how to dress, what to do with their bodies, and how to fall in love with, or they will be free to, de to determine these elements themselves. It is about whether we unconditionally continue loving male prophets and their medieval ideas, or we will finally become our own prophets. It is finally about whether to continue to accept imaginary male gods or acknowledging, finally acknowledging that woman is God. Because women are the ultimate creators. Sisters, I talk to you right now with my last sentence. I want to ask you all together to stop asking if God or religious leaders if imam, rabbi, or priest in your church will let you be free. Let's finally start asking ourselves who's gonna stop us from being free. Thank you. Ina, where are you? Oh, there. Respect. Um, we're, going, uh, we're going to build up the stage, and we need a minute or, or two. And I feel, I feel good. Do you feel good? Are you happy to be here? Yeah. 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 So it takes some minutes. You see, men are helping us building up stage. Uh, uh, because there are a lot of men too, maybe we are not going to talk with them, but they are helping to, to, uh, uh, to build up uh, the stage. I'm going to have some water. Taslima and Ina and Mariam, can you please take a seat? We are going to have a talk, a good talk.
give water to him? Yes. I have a microphone too, oh, that's nice. Ladies and gentlemen, we are, uh, we are going to talk. In my mind, it's now working and working and working. How can we talk about so many things, issues, uh, in half an hour? But we are going to do it, and after uh, we have 15 uh, maybe uh, 20 minutes uh, for you, because I think you have some questions for these power ladies. Um, can you, because uh, we are now in the present, eh? we talked about now and the power and what is going on now, but um, can you please, because you said it is born in Bangladesh, eh? you said it uh, 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 in your speech, uh, you said about growing uh, up, can you tell uh, hey, you were born in Iran. Can you tell me some more about um, when was the first time that you became, uh, uh, that you criticized your own culture? It's not only religion, it's often also culture. I'm uh, myself uh, born in uh, Morocco. I was raised up as uh, a Muslim. And, and there must be things or a thing or maybe one day. Can you tell me something more about hey, being born as a woman, a powerful woman? Uh, in the Ukraine? Mm -hmm. Ina? Oh, yeah, yeah, you can, can start. start. Okay. Um, yes, of course, the context is different, yet, again, the question of women's rights, we always say, always insist that question of women's rights is a universal question because oppression of women is universal. And from country to country right now, we will, of course, uh, make clear the differences of the context, yet there will be a lot of commonalities in our stories. Um, yes, I, uh, I grew up during the decade after the collapse of USSR. Uh, this crisis that affected the whole society and the, as any other crisis, um, this crisis pushed um, women and punished women uh, with a double punishment. And women suffered more than uh, the rest of the society. Um, simply for the fact of being a woman. And actually what is very interesting about this very moment, um, in USSR religion was, um, let's say, from the uh, perspective of the state, it was irrelevant. Yet, um, once the crisis came and there, were a lot of, there was a lot of uncertainty, religion suddenly became very actual again. And um, it uh, gained its momentum, its momentum at the time when people began to suffer. And uh, many women, of course, including my mother and um, uh, my aunts and my grandmother, turned themselves to the churches because indeed there were no offices, the, the, the doors and the offices were closed to them. There was no job, there was no opportunity. And, uh, to, um, you know, to go and uh, kind of express their suffering in silence, they could do it only in the churches. And of course, religions use those moments once again to gain its, its power. Yeah, I understand. I, I, I've been in holiday in Morocco, I go often uh, back, and my niece, she's 30 now, she has no future, no work, eh? she's not married, no children, and, and what does she have to do? Only reading the Quran the whole day, there is nothing more, and that's what I recognize when you say, you hey, uh, go to the church, but what do I have to do? There is for her, there's hope, not in a life now, but after that, it's... it's it's interesting, you know, just to sum this up, um, why this happens. I just was speaking about that religions want us passive. Mm -hmm. And that's, it, it is exactly about it. Mm -hmm. Going to church and being passive. Mm -hmm. That's how religion transforms and reshapes our lives. I understand. Uh, um, I want yeah. to add to what Ina is saying. I think actually it doesn't give you hope because it pacifies you and it doesn't give you hope for your life today. And I think there are so many young people who are also turning to progressive social movements, uh, to feminism, to secular movements, to uh, rights movements. And so I think we, we have to make 
enough space so that people who feel hopeless, I think people who read the Quran all day, a young woman, has lost hope in a way, and that's why they turn to that. And uh, similar to Ina, I mean, uh, as, as she said, there are so many commonalities. Uh, for me, from Iran, I yeah. mean, I uh, uh, grew up in a family that was quite secular. My aunt is here, uh, so I can't say anything about my family. <laughs> uh, but. Um, uh, my family was actually a very secular family. My father, even though he's a believing Muslim, he is a staunch supporter of myself, and uh, he always uh, it has always supported me. I come from a family that my grandfather was an Islamic uh, scholar. Uh, he was a mullah, actually, but my family says, don't say mullah because everybody hates mullahs. Yeah. Call him an Islamic scholar. Yeah. You know? That's much better, not really. And uh, my father always says, you know, your grandfather would be turning in the grave if he heard what you said. And, uh, you know, we know that can't happen, but, uh, you know, and I try to explain that to my dad. But uh, so it come from that background where my father's religious, he doesn't drink, he doesn't uh, um, eat pork, uh, he grew up praying. But interestingly, m none of my aunts were veiled, even though my grandfather was a... Uh, religious scholar, and uh, they were quite open-minded. So my, my father married a Protestant, for example. Well, she became Muslim to marry him, but it was quite an open-minded family. So for me, religion was never an issue. I was born Muslim, but yeah. uh, it was never shoved down my throat until the Islamists came to Iran. And then I realized, oh my God, this is a very, very scary movement. And I remember, I have images of angry, bearded, uh, you know, Hezbollahs uh, coming to our school, segregating the gir girls from the boys, demonstrating in the streets, uh, hitting women who were veiled, uh, unveiled, because the veiling was not compulsory then yet. So there are these sorts of images. And I think uh, Iran is key, you know, because we've had an Islamic state for over 40 years. And that was the beginning of the exportation of the political Islamic movement in contemporary history. So I think since then, we've seen changes in all of our societies, from Morocco to Tunisia to Algeria, you name it, that there are, you know, the, and, and Europe, you know, Bangladesh, you know, people were not veiled to the extent that they are today. In, from Tower Hamlet to Dhaka, you know, and that has had a huge effect. On the other hand, uh, I feel I belong to this also international movement of feminists and secularists, uh, and we are even more powerful than them because they need violence. They can't manage without violence. Yeah, but, uh, but what, what do you say? Uh, just uh, last week, a woman was sentenced again 24 years for not wearing a scarf. Uh, because you say there, there is a future and there is a movement and indeed there is movement also because of social media, eh, we share, eh, but uh, do you think, uh, do you think um, we, we can uh, change because sometimes I feel very sad because also with uh, the example of last yeah. week. I mean, look, uh, this regime has been killing people for 40 years, yes. uh, imprisoning women for 40 years. Yeah. Uh, you know, the slogan of the Islamists that imposed the veil in Iran was either a punch or the hijab. They threw acid in women's faces. They still do today. They put pins in women's heads to pin the hijab on their heads yeah. when they refused to initially wear it. And when women had a protest against compulsory veiling on March 8th, International Women's Day, mm -hmm. early in the early stages, they came with chains and motorcycles and yeah. attacked the women. So this is a, a something that women have faced throughout the decades. Yeah. So. They're fighting back. That should give you hope. They're getting 24 years in prison. We have to make sure that they're free. I understand. But they are fighting for a, a different world, the same world that we're fighting for. And yeah. that's why solidarity with them is so important. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, so many Western feminists are more concerned yeah, we're with going defending to, yeah. culture and we're, religion yeah. than defending women's we're rights. We're going to talk uh, later about uh, Western uh, feminism and about uh, universal rights and not Western or white or uh, uh, right. Uh, I want to know, because you did not have many or maybe a little uh, problems with your family, yeah, very liberated Muslim Muslims, but uh, you had, of course, uh, you had to leave your country. Can you tell me something about that? You, the, the biggest problems were the problems with the authorities. Can you tell us something about uh, that? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, a lot of you will be refugees and asylum seekers, and that in itself is very painful. You know, having to leave your country yes. and never go back. We, we're all in this situation. And I think that's something so painful. Uh, sometimes also when you leave, you don't expect never to be allowed to go back. And uh, never seeing uh, your grandmother die, going, being able to go to her funeral. Um, uh, my uncle died last week. I can't go to his funeral. Sorry. So it's very painful. I'll let you talk now. Yes. Sorry, I'm also very emotional. Crazy, hysterical woman. You shared, yeah. Yeah, you can talk. Okay. Can you tell us something about hey, what happened? Yes, uh, hey. When Mariam is uh, talking about that uh, she couldn't go back to Iran to see her uh, grandmother or uncle died, uh, you know, to their funeral. You know, I have been living in exile for 25 years. Um, in August 1994, I was, you know, thrown out of my country. Since then, I was not allowed to enter my country. So in the meantime, my mother died. And when my father was in his deathbed, I pleaded, I cried. I wanted to go back to my country to see him for, you know, for two days. But the government didn't allow me to enter my country, my father died. And then all my, uh, you know, relatives who loved me so much and I loved them, like my grandmother, my aunts, my uncles, all died. And I couldn't go to see them before they died. And um, so there is uh, actually no one my close relatives, on my f and also my f brothers, my elder brothers died, and uh, I couldn't see them before they died. And uh, now I have no close relatives in, my, in Bangladesh, but I still want to go back. It's because of my right to go back to the country that where I was born and raised. Not only was born and raised, not because of that. I, I believe in uh, freedom of movement. Anybody should have the right to go wherever they want to go to. And, but, you know, the, the people say that, uh, okay, you know, I think what country means to me is, is not the land anymore. The country means, after 25 years of living in exile, I believe that country actually means people who, who support you, who you know, showed solidarity to you. So and the people also around the world you. become your family now. Yeah, and they are my country. They are my uh, home. I feel at home with them. You know, if I go back to my country ever, if it is possible, I don't, I don't think so. I will not feel at home in, you know, with all these fundamentalist religionists, all the veiled women now, you know. 25 years, it's living in exile. You have been, I've been threatened because of saying things uh, in a newspaper. And I was afraid, but I cannot imagine because a fatwa is a fatwa. It's, it's big. How can you live and, and, and be the woman you are with such a power and not being afraid? You know, it's not fatwa. I don't care about fatwas. You know, in, when, when, in Bang, when I was living in Bangladesh and fatwas were issued that whoever could kill me, you know, that the price was set on my head, 100,000, you know, rupees or takas and all those uh, the money and some people uh, some mullahs announced unlimited amount of money if you know they would give to the killer of mine so uh, you know i wanted to live in bangladesh even the fatwas were issued 
I was not afraid, but the problem was that not what was. It was the government who, who actually uh, threw me out of the country. And also in India, where I'm living now, five fatwas were issued against me. Okay. Uh, yeah, it was gov the government who, um, you know, forced me to leave the country. I, 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 want to, I want to live in those countries where fatwa is very issued. I, because, you know, I never left any country because fatwa is very issued. I was forced to leave the country, <laughs> both India and Bangladesh. But I managed to live in India now. Yeah, but, but at any moment, I will be thrown out of that country. In India? And in I, India, and now. You, Yeah, you live in India now. Why did now. you make the church to live in India because uh, a lot of people choose uh, the safety of Europe. But for, why? Because you wa didn't want to leave uh, India, Bangladesh. You didn't want to leave really and want to stay I wanted by. to live in Bangladesh, uh, you know, because I was doing lots of work actually for women. But it was the government who, who doesn't allow me to enter the country, but I chose then because uh, neighboring countries, I chose to live in neighboring countries. India, because I, I speak in one of the Indian languages, and it is for me easier to yeah. uh, continue my writings, yeah. and also the women are oppressed so much, yeah. human rights are violated every day, so I could fight for that. Yeah. So I, India is the only place where I can, no, actually I shouldn't say India is the only place, because in, uh, in, Cal in West Bengal part of India, I cannot live. I'm not allowed to live in many parts of India, only the, in the capital. And, uh, and uh, it is the only place in the Indian subcontinent that I can live. So, so I want to live there. I don't want to be in safe area in the Western, even though I'm, in, I'm okay. a Swedish citizen, true, I but understand. I chose to live there because I can fight for women's rights and human yes. rights and freedom of expression. Yes. That's, that's, uh, yeah, you can say it. And then my next question is, why this uh, festival uh, organized here in Amsterdam, in the Bali, and uh, you organized uh, this with the Bali, why is it um, so important to meet, to discuss? And I have another question. This is a safe space. And, and isn't it a little time to get out of the safe space? And, and how? What can we do uh, to go a step further? Uh, well, if I can just make a few points. One is that a lot of uh, uh, free thinkers who uh, are not refugees and asylum seekers, they were born in uh, Europe and uh, they faced tremendous amounts of problems. When I uh, first started the ex-Muslim council in Britain, I was astonished at how frightened people were who were born and raised in Britain. And the shunning and ostracization and the shaming that takes place and this a really need for all these young people to be loved by their families. And so there is that painful, very, very painful aspect of it. It's not just the refugee flight, but there's also so much hope. hope. And I think one of it is because of social media and the internet, we've been able to find each other. And I think, uh, and, and not be alone for the first time in our lives for many of us, and also not to feel crazy, you know, your families take you for an exorcism. I mean, I'm lucky my family was was supportive, but, you know, f people being taken to be exercised, people being... Because uh, you are not religious because anymore. Because you're not religious or anymore. you are homosexual, yeah. lesbian. Forcibly married, sent off to uh, the home country to be, uh, you know, properly, properly made obedient. So social media has helped us to find each other. That the is problem good. is that you might consider this a safe space, but for us, this is a very, very small aspect of our lives. The majority of our lives are, facing, are faced with unsafe spaces, with people who are constantly threatening us, abusing us, vilifying us, dehumanizing us. So uh, that's why, you know, it, we need this because we need to get our strength back. Exactly. We need to remember that we are very powerful. You just need to hear, you know, this one speak. And you're okay for another year or two, actually. <laughs> Not even five months. You know, it's great. So we, we don't need to have one. And, and I think Debali, uh, you know, when, when I came and spoke here in January, I was taken back by them, to be honest, because I have never been treated so nicely. 
And I thought either they have no idea who I am because that's usually when I am treated nicely. And then even after I spoke, they still treated me nicely. And I thought, you know, these are people who really care about but can you, these no, but, issues. But you said it, and, and we laugh about it. But can you imagine eh, about uh, freedom and thoughts and, and be who you want to be? Eh? Also what you said, and you were like surprised they are nice to me after I have spoken. It, it, it's amaze, it, it amazed me still uh, every time that you, that you said uh, they are so nice to me after what I said. And especially you, know, you have, what you have to say, it's great. Even if I di disagree, but we can talk about it. That's what I want, what I said about this has safe space, but uh, we have to be with uh, much uh, more. That's why can you say about the importance of coming together, being universal, traveling, and, and fighting uh, in your way, in everybody's way, for freedom of speech and expression. Yes, I would like to react on this, on this notion of safe space. Um, here, considering this place as a safe space, you know, I consider this space as an amazing space, beautiful space. You know, but it's not safe. I, I mean, I, I don't feel safe, I'm sorry. Because I was uh, in 2015 in a room smaller than this with 20 people in front of uh, me coming to listen um, a talk on blasphemy. And behind the door from this side, I heard the shots of Kalashnikov. Someone came to, you know, and instead of listening to us, or just not listen, choosing not to listen to us, he decided to take a gun and to, sh to shut our mouths by killing us. Um, you know, so I think that very often, and that's a big mistake, and it's something I'm really struggling with in Western countries, is this illusion that here uh, we've reached all these freedoms and safety, and the fight, fight is needed somewhere there in Bangladesh, in Iran, but not here. You know, and this bothers me a lot because first of all, we ignore that those people in Bangladesh, in Iran, they need our support. And the best way we can support them is not by saving them, but by saving ourselves here and, you know, c uh, protecting our own values our own democracy, our, our own freedom of speech, and then those countries will have to catch up by, you know, through, uh, by going it their, uh, through their own way and doing it their own way. But if countries like these countries, Western countries, will also uh, ignore and kind of forget about this fight for those important values, then the governments in Iran also can justify their crimes against human rights. So, you know, I, I absolutely don't feel comfortable with this idea that in Western countries we are safe. I personally do not feel safe again. Uh, I ran away from Ukraine from um, the threat was five years in jail. I came to Copenhagen and the threat was to get killed. So please don't think that you're safe. You know, and it's, it's when we start thinking that we are safe, we start actually dying. We, because we, we would become passive. That's, that's a mistake. And another thing, Taslima touched this very beautiful point on what is home, and it's again connected to this feeling of safety. And I don't feel, again, as when I say I don't feel safe anywhere, it's, all, it's not just about um, public events, or it's, it's anywhere. In the street, I don't feel safe as a woman. In events, I don't feel safe as a, as a woman who speaks out. And you know, and think about it that for every woman, how this, safety, how this question of safety and not having your own home and land, how, how huge this question is. Even our bodies, something that is, you know, supposed to belong to us only, our only territory, even this, is attacked, um, invaded by religious morals, by sexist ideas, you know, by all the patriarchal laws, legislations that they continue passing. They continue applying it on our lives. So that's why the first fight for every woman, I believe, I'm convinced, is liberating this, our own proper territory 
and taking it in control because that's the only home you can have. And even this home is occupied. So it's really about this very only home really taking the keys back and locking yourself <laughs> and feeling safe there, you know? <laughs> We have, uh, we have a couple of minutes and then we have some questions from uh, the audience. I, I would like to have, because you said it and uh, you all said it, um, people like um, uh, telling us, because you, you need allies from, hey, what, in what way or another you need allies and we have to become with more and more and more and uh, the movement, international movement, has to uh, grow. But they said, um, yes, but those women, when I talk about, hey, with my friends, religious, not religious, my Jewish, uh, 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 LHBTQ plus uh, 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 friends, but when uh, we talk, they say, yeah, yes, but those women are exactly what you said, are radical, hysterical, but for me, it's very difficult sometimes to explain. It's, it's very difficult. How can, we, uh, how can we find a word and what do we need? Because we also need those uh, uh, women. Can you say something about this? <laughs> about radical, about being radical? Uh, about needing allies, being uh, radical, hysterical, but what you say, the freedom is universal, the freedom of expression, the freedom of thought, and what you say about Islamists, fundamentalists, all tried, uh, it's, it's true. So, uh, I mean, I, I think uh, it, it's a difficult struggle. I think we, we struggle to find allies, all of us do, I think we, we know. And partly it's because we live in a, in a time now where identity politics reigns supreme. And there is this respect and privilege of com the so-called homogenous community. And you know, when you respect a community, you give them group rights. And those rights are that which the clerics and the, those in power have uh, given to that, that group. And uh, any sort of deviation from that path is immediately equated with bigotry and racism yeah. and an attack on a minority community. Yeah. And so it, it, we are in a very difficult position. We do feel very alone a lot of the times. And that's why, for me, this sort... I get really emotional when I'm with you, you lot. Because for me, it just gives me so much strength and so much hope. And I think, uh, you know, we just have to keep talking and getting people to understand that it is racist to not see the dissent and the doubt and the feminism and secularism and universalism within minority communities. We are just like anybody else. We have hopes and we have dreams. We want rights, we want freedoms, we want more even. Because if you've lived under the boot of the religious light, right, you know more than anyone what it means not to be free, what it means not to be in control of your body, your hair, your feet, your vagina, all the things that, that uh, Ina talked about. You know more than anybody else. And, and this idea, this idea that, you know, only Western women want freedoms, only white women want those freedoms. We have to live within the confines of Islam, confines of that relegated to us. That is pure and simple racism. And you have to move beyond that. You know, I think the problem with identity politics is it excludes everyone, everyone who doesn't agree with the mullah or the rabbi or the cleric. You know, our politics has to be the one that includes everyone. Regardless of your background, we are, have in common one thing, our humanity. And I think that's how we move forward. That's why this, our stressing universalism, secularism, uh, feminism, that is the key to unlocking the allies uh, across the world that are the same as us, fighting for the very same things. Fighting for the very uh, same things, thank you. <laughs> yes, one hand, two, three, and four, to begin with. And the mic, I can come up, no problem. 
Yeah. Can you tell her? Yes? Yes, because you were the first. Can you please give it, me the microphone back when I ask you? <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> God. Also, uh, English, sorry. Uh, so my, I'm Lilith and I'm from Germany, originally from Pakistan, atheist and a trans woman, working for the atheist as well as LGBT rights in, pa in Germany. Uh, thank you for being here, all of you. It's so enthusiastic. Now, yeah, uh, two things. I have two comments and one question. Uh, safe spaces, it's not a good idea. Forget it. We need to talk. We need to have a debate. We need to argue and we have to come up with solutions. Secondly, both of you girls, thank you. I'm a whore as well. <laughs> <laughs> and now the question. Uh, since I'm living openly as a woman in Germany, uh, the criticism that I face is why don't I show solidarity to women in Germany who wants to wear hijab? And I show more solidarity to those women who are not in Germany and do not want to wear scarves. And the problem is, it's not the women who wear scarves tell me that. It's the white, privileged, cis, heterosexual women who come up to me and tell me, you know, Lilith, but in Germany, it's different. Um, yes, it is. I know there are cer uh, certain things which are different. But women are being put into jails. Women are beaten to death for not putting a hijab on their head. So please stop infantilizing us to all white women here as well. Thank you. So uh, last thing. What would you do uh, in my situation? That's the question. Yes, because, because, thank you very much, great question. Because, you know, um, uh, if you are not with you, uh, I cannot be with you and with my Islamic Muslim uh, friends with hijab. I have to be with you or with them. I, I cannot choose. And there are so many Islamophobia, they are oppressed too. And uh, that's why, great question. I start with you and uh, short uh, answer, please, because we have another three questions. That's a big question. That's actually a very, very important question uh, because we come back again and again to these accusations. Um, so let me answer um, first. I would like just to react very quickly um, uh, on what you say, and this also this expression that bothers me a lot: these white women, who, white privileged women. Who are they? Am I a white privileged woman? But I was told I was white and privileged woman so many times. So, and when I said, but what makes me white and privileged? Uh, growing, being born in a third world level of poverty country, growing up in poverty, growing up in a country where 60% of female students are sexually exploited, does all of this makes me privileged? Or like, what's the, what is the definition of whiteness and privilege, you know? I have a problem with that. So I'm struggling to find an answer and I'm looking for someone who's gonna answer me. Really, honestly, I'm struggling, but I, yeah, I think we have to really work on this uh, problem. <laughs> and then, you know, the question of um, hijab and uh, all the, it's not really the question of hijab only. The question, it's, it's a question of religious dress code imposed on women's bodies for a very specific political reason. You know, this, usually this um, German, uh, Western, you would call them, right, feminists, who have this, you know, who say, why don't you support women who wear hijab? Yes. Because they consider this to be any, as any other clothes, right? And they say, if you want to wear mini shorts, fine, but why don't you want this woman to wear hijab if she wants exactly. to wear? You know, and the whole debate, then op big debates have to, to, to start because we cannot, we cannot allow, first, the first point, we cannot allow religious dress code to be considered as any other clothes because um, it's not, you know, it's indeed, it's not just clothes. It's a political, political flags 
put on women. You know, they are supposed to mean something. Those political flags, they are made to sexualize women. Many of these hijabi women tell me, my hijab is my dignity. You, you look naked, you are sexualized, and me, you know, I protect my sexuality. But indeed, she's the one who's sexualized because she covers herself up because there is this idea behind the hijab that she's sexual by definition. Okay. You know? And, and when they dress up, when they, when they wear hijabs um, over these young little girls, I mean, this is a crime. To, to mark these little children as sexual objects in such a young age. So the whole debate about wearing or not wearing, you know, and just one more thing about hijab, I want to say it's not only about women. It's this, this religious dress code is not only degrading to women, it's degrading to men. Because the idea behind it is, not, is that women are these sexual objects, and, but it's also the idea behind it that men are sexual animals who can control themselves in front of a woman with a hair yeah. in the wind. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Uh, can I just add a few things uh, quickly? The idea of safe space, I think, is dangerous. I mean, I've been saying it's nice to be in a safe space, but it's used against us very often. I had Islamists that invite speakers that want the death penalty for apostates shouting, safe space, it looks like the X factor, yeah. safe space when I was speaking. And so, you know, the idea is that no, when there's an exchange of ideas, no place should be safe because okay. that's we need to challenge each other. Okay. But also one uh, other quick point is that the issue of defending women, why do you need to defend their hijab? You know, defend women, defend people against bigotry. But why, you know, if, if you, uh, you know, you have these women who go and wear the hijab in solidarity with hijabi women. So are you going to go cut your genitals to support women who've had FGM? Are you going to bind your feet? Uh, you know, oppose, oppose women's oppression, but at the same time, we don't have time for claps, guys. <laughs> Oppose women's oppression, but, uh, you know, uh, stand with women, but oppose what's oppressing them. And I think that's what, what is very clear and, and can easily be done. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. One uh, question. You, please. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for being here. My name is Andis van Rijen. I work in international affairs. And a few uh, years ago, I worked as an assistant for the Dutch ambassador at the Vatican. So I've seen how religious diplomacy can be uh, a force for good in uh, international affairs. Um, I don't go to church often, but I have done in difficult personal times. And I found relief um, that I couldn't find in the secular world. <coughs> as to say. So, but I'm also a feminist and also completely support um, your fight against oppression of, of women like you told in your stories, because my story is not your story. So what is my place in, in, in the movement and how can I support you? Uh, religious and, and, and yeah, I mean, I, I, th I think your place is right here with us, darling. And the reality is it's because, look, we're not saying that you have to be an unbeliever to be with okay. us. We're saying that if we agree, believers and non-believers, that okay. the world will be better if we defend universalism, secularism, and feminism, then our place is together. And we need to be Great. together to win. Great. All together. Oh, I had uh, 1,900 more questions, and I think you too. But we have the whole day. And, and then we have tomorrow, so, and we're going to have a great lunch. But you want me uh, to tell me something, eh? because to the audience. No, no, I just wanted to say I'm sorry for that we cannot take uh, uh, more questions, but uh, uh, there will be a lot more programs, and we really have to be on time. So, uh, yes. sorry. Yes, I'm, thank you so much, because maybe people think, oh, you don't want to know. We have a lot of things to do. Um, I think you have to make place, because we have uh, one guest more. Thank you so much. Can, can they have an applause? And yes, can you please stand up and 
Show, yeah, yeah, show your t-shirt. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, um, an award-winning body artist, she's passionate about merging art with science. Um, as they share the common ancestors of human imagination, Victoria's art has been a lifelong quest of the othering people through uh, art, public speaking, and personal aesthetic choice. Can I have a warm welcome for Victoria Kuggenheim? <laughs> What a lovely welcome, thank you so much. So I first of all want to say thank you everyone for being here because this is all of our fight and freedom is really fragile and has to be protected, especially in these times. And uh, I also want to extend the biggest thank you to Mariam Namazi for having me here because she's inspired all of my activism and if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be on this stage today. So can we have a massive round of applause please for Mariam Namazi? Excellent. So this piece I'm doing is going to take each and every one of you, and it's called 99 Red Balloons. And each balloon represents a life, an atheist that has been persecuted or killed simply for their non-belief. So they're being uh, brought in now by our lovely interns. So all of you, start getting up. You need to start taking each one of these balloons. So I'm talking to you and you, all of you. Stand up, stand up. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Yep, you just need to take one and go back to your seats. Excellent. So I see you at the back, come on. <laughs> I'd also like to ask that if you can stand during this presentation, that's going to really make it very effective. So please don't sit down, please remain standing with your balloon if you're able to. That's it, keep going, guys. Excellent, guys, keep going. <laughs> yeah, we've already had one rogue incident.
Excellent. Brilliant stuff. Does anyone not have a balloon? Okay, we have a few more up here, guys. We only have a few left. This is brilliant stuff. Okay. Go okay, past this one. Thank you, guys. You want the camera guys to happen? We have two left. Who doesn't have a balloon? So I want to challenge anyone who thinks that art can't be political, because the first time I premiered this at the Global Secular Humanist Conference, someone looked at a name tag and realized it was his friend he hadn't seen for a while, and he found out that night his friend had been assassinated simply for being an atheist. So this is for every dissenter, every free thinker, every single feminist who has been persecuted, killed, punished, simply for free thinking. This is a demonstration that freedom is fragile and has to be protected. We cannot tolerate the intolerant. We have to come together and realize that if we don't protect each other, if we don't stand up in solidarity, that our fight is over. The other side will have won, especially with the rise of right-wing politics. It's not going to take much for Trump or Boris Johnson to suddenly put in religious doctrine. They're already doing this covertly anyway in the US, especially with now the heartbeat bill that's being passed and restricting women's rights to have control over their own body. So I want you to have a moment of silence and look at the tag that you've got and realize that one tag, that tag you're looking at is representative of a life and that could be you. You could end up on one of these tags if we don't protect each other and we don't fight for these freedoms. And now I want you to give universally a massive round of applause for every single atheist, every single activist, every single feminist, every single person in this room, every single person who's fought for freedom and equality and human rights and justice, and that includes you. Applaud yourself as well. Amazing. Now, if you'll all join me, these are going to have their final resting place in the main foyer, and this is going to be used as a conversation piece. Maybe some people on these tags you'll know. Maybe these people used to be your friends and they've passed on. But we need to keep these people in memory because it's not just an over there problem. It's not just Saudi Arabia, it's not just Iraq, it's not just Pakistan, it happens here too. People have been killed in the Netherlands because of atheism, because of free thinking. We need to protect ourselves. And with that, thank you so much. Thank you for participating in this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And will you please join me in a walk? Thank you so much. I'm so proud. Um, what can we do with uh, balloons? Um, so, the foyer. Okay, we are going. Thank you so much for being here. And we're going to be here the whole evening and tomorrow. And maybe I will see you on Sunday. Thank you so much. Thank you. Cada uno tiene la carga de su camino.